Welcome to the Freak Show, fellow freaks. I'm Matthew Brockmeyer. And I'm Krista Carmen. And this is... Murder Coaster. Oh, what a freak show we have for you today, ladies and gentlemen. It is the story of a teenager who was able to catfish and taunt some of the most dangerous and deadly psychopaths in the history of true crime, including Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee Cannibal, Charles Manson, and John Wayne Gacy, the Killer Clown. Yes, a teenager was able to deceive and trick this bizarre cast of criminals into letting him into their worlds. But in doing so, he also opened himself up to their worlds as well, and in the end, paid a terrible, terrible price. Step right up, step right up, come in here. The tragic tale of Jason Moss, the teenage serial killer whisperer. Let's begin. Prologue, the final victim. Why 31-year-old attorney Jason Moss went to the bathroom of his Nevada home, put a gun to his head, and pulled the trigger, ending his own life on June 6, 2006, isn't known, though there is much speculation on the subject. It is known that he'd gone through severe bouts of depression and been hounded by horrific nightmares involving the serial killers he'd once called friends. Terrible dreams where the psychopathic killers he'd conversed with now teased and taunted, calling on him to join them in their fiendish ways. Much was made of the date, June the 6th, 2006, or 6606. Could it be a clue? Was it a reference to 666? The number 666 has long been a symbol of evil and associated with the devil, stemming from the 13th chapter of the Book of Revelations, which reads, Here is wisdom. Let him who hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six jason would surely have been well aware of this as he had delved deep into black magic and devil worship while corresponding with the infamous night stalker richard ramirez had he chosen the day of his suicide based on numerology had he been plagued by the idea of dark forces controlling him demons from the abyss or was it just coincidence And many wondered why this man who'd been a gifted honor student, president of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas's Psychology Honor Society, and chief justice of the student council, a man who graduated from college summa cum laude before going on to law school and becoming attorney, why had he ever corresponded with monsters and psychopaths like Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, Henry Lee Lucas, Richard Ramirez, and Charlie Manson to begin with. Yes, what would lead a highly intelligent young man with a strong moral compass to reach out to convicted murderers, rapists, cannibals, and necrophiles and tell them he was their friend, that he admired them and wanted to be like them? Well, some of the answers can be found in his book that was published just six years before he took his own life, a book entitled The Last Victim, a title which would become incredibly poignant. Ladies and gentlemen, Chapter One, 
Jason. Jason Michael Moss was born February 3rd, 1975, in Las Vegas, Nevada, to a wholesome, hardworking, upper middle class Jewish family. He was the first born to his parents, the first grandchild to his grandparents, the first nephew among his uncles, and the first child among his parents' friends, which his mother says is why he was spoiled rotten. As his mother Sue herself says, He was doted on by everyone. He was always the center of attention. Jason was an all-American little boy, a gifted athlete and trombone player who loved trading baseball cards and collecting rare coins. He was always an excellent student. In many ways, the perfect child. Always there for his little brother Jared, who was four years younger than him. But Jason says he suffered from abandonment issues as a child and had a deep fear of being kidnapped and suffered from chlorophobia, an irrational fear of clowns. Clowns terrified him. Just seeing one would cause him to burst into tears. And he often had terrible nightmares about an evil clown drenched in blood, slaughtering his grandmother at the base of his stairs. Yeah, that, that's scary as shit right there. Fuck. Well, because of his nightmares and deep-seated fear of clowns, his parents forbid him to watch horror movies. But when all his friends started talking about the movie Friday the 13th, which featured a killer with the same name as him, Jason decided to confront his fears and see what was forbidden to him. Though the movie did scare the hell out of him, he was soon obsessed, reading Fangoria magazine and filling his room with horror movie posters, going so far as to dangle a fake dead body from his bedroom ceiling. I mean, I dig it. I had a subscription to Fangoria as a kid, and my room was totally full of horror movie posters. But I have to say, dangling a prop corpse from your ceiling... It's a little intense. Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb there and say that <laughs> one's like not quite as normal. No judgment. Uh, no judgment. On right. right. <laughs> uh, his, his mother was a true crime fanatic, and his earliest memories were her with her head stuck between the pages of books like Bloodlust, Blood Echoes, Blood Games, Brothers in Blood, and Blood Warning. It seemed to Jason that blood was always in the title of the true crime books his mother read. He recounts going to the library as a little kid and his mother excitedly telling him about the new book she had found on Ed Gein, the butcher of Plainsfield, and telling him about the ghoulish items found in his farmhouse, the belt made of nipples, a box of severed vaginas, lampshades made of human skin and a bed with skulls on the posts and then actually showing him a photograph of the decapitated and gutted body of Bernice Warden hanging like a slaughtered animal in Gein's barn. A truly horrific image that Jason says long plagued him. His mother forbids him from watching horror movies, but then shows him some of the most gruesome crime scene photos imaginable. Interesting parenting choice. <laughs> as disturbing as it all was, Jason says he was deeply revolted and sickened by it, but it still sparked a deep interest in true crime. Yeah, Ed Gein, dude. He, he hooks them all the time. He's like a true crime gateway drug. I don't know why, but there's just something so iconic and fascinating about that weird guy. I mean, he was the inspiration for Norman Bates and Leatherface, among many others. But right away, Jason was getting a little weird about it, saying about his early fascination with serial killers, quote, I was amazed by the power these killers wielded. I began pretending to be the person I was reading about. I imagined what it would be like to stalk and kill. I tried to pretend I was someone without a conscience. I tried to get to that level of consciousness where one exults in being truly evil. 
I'm not sure I ever fully got there. I am, after all, a sane person, a moral person. But the attempt to reach the other side was exhilarating. Yeah, honestly, that's that's fucking creepy to me. <laughs> but a lot of this guy, he just comes off creepy to me as he's pretending to be a violent psychopath. He's also lifting weights and taking kickboxing classes, setting up a pole in his backyard so he can beat on it to get his hands and feet toughened up. And he claims that when he turned 16 years old, he was able to seduce his friend's mother and sleep with her. Very odd. And it's, it's also statutory rape. But he's proud of it, and he makes himself sound like a Casanova. But any grown woman who sleeps with a 16-year-old boy is suspect as hell in my book. Life is not an 80s soft porn flicks on Cinemax. In the real world, that's a crime. And what's his friend going to say to him? Dude, that's so cool you fucked my mom. Right on, bro. He also says that though he was a clean-cut honor student and athlete, he liked to hang out with the bad kids, and he learned their language, going up to the stoners and saying, What's going down, my man? So suave. <laughs> then he'd say, I bought an eighth last night for 20. Some really good fucking shit. And when the druggies asked an insider question to test him, like... Was it laced with coke, man? He'd nod knowingly and pass their test, making them think he was one of them. These are his own words. When I read it, I just saw a bunch of stoner kids laughing at an idiot nerd trying to be cool. And I actually really believe that this is the same reaction he got from Richard Ramirez and Charlie Manson, who seemed to just think he was an amusing idiot and were totally using him all while he thought he was being the master manipulator. Now, I hate to say this. I don't want to be cruel and like, I, I kind of, I want to like this guy. But if you think about this, pretending to do drugs around the stoner kids in high school, it, it really shows how superficial and fake he is in a way. I mean, just like psychopathic serial killers, they have to pretend to be something because there's not actually anything there. Everything they do is fake because they're empty. Just like Brett Easton Ellis describes in American Psycho. And in another disturbing anecdote, Jason says he pretended to be transsexual so he could learn more about what he calls, quote, the most exotic people of all. Yeah, yeah, there, there's just so much to unpack there. I, I don't even know where to get started. Especially as he says he enjoyed tricking trans people into sending him pictures of themselves. That shit would not fly today. I can tell you that. And throughout the book, he just keeps insisting he's not gay. Like he repeats it over and over and over. I'm not gay. I'm not gay. I'm straight as an arrow. Saying things like, quote, references to homosexuality were unsettling to me. But I felt secure in my own heterosexual inclinations. End quote. I, mean, I don't know. I, I really don't know. But, you know, kind of sounds like the lady doth protest too much. Mm, interesting. Uh, so after graduating high school, an all A student in honors and advanced placement classes, by the way. Yeah, he's definitely no dummy. He's very, very smart. Jason opts to stay in his hometown, where he can continue to live in his parents' house, and begins undergraduate studies at the University of Las Vegas as a psychology major. While killing time one day, waiting for his kickboxing classes to start, he wandered into a used bookstore and came across the book, The Killer Clown, The John Wayne Gacy Murders by Terry Sullivan and Peter Macon. An absolute classic which has sent many a person spiraling into a true crime obsession. And as I'm sure you all know, John Wayne Gacy brutally tortured and murdered 33 young men and boys outside of Chicago in the late 70s, burying 30 of them in the crawl space beneath his home. And he loved to dress as a clown, a persona he called Pogo. The book really intrigued Jason, encapsulating everything that terrified him. Bloody murder and clowns. 
Reading the back cover of the paperback, he was struck by how a man could dress up as a clown by day to entertain sick children, then stalk the streets at night for young boys to savagely murder and brutally sexually assault. When his mother saw him reading The Killer Clown, she laughed and said, Ha! You can't handle blood. You've always been afraid of clowns. I hope you don't pass out while you're reading. Setting up a bit of a competition to see who can handle the most fucked up shit. Sounds like me and my friends, actually. But she was right. The book made Jason queasy, nauseous. He'd get lightheaded and sick, but he just could not put it down. The victims were all the same age as Jason was. They looked like him, bright-eyed and clean-cut, and had been subjected to the worst forms of torture and sexual depravity imaginable before they were strangled to death and tossed like trash into Gacy's crawl space. Yet this monster ran a successful construction business, making upwards of $300,000 a year in 1970s money. He was head of the Jaycees, knew the mayor, had even met with the First Lady Rosalind Carter, was a community leader, How could he maintain these two separate lives? And it was at this moment that Jason wondered what would happen if he wrote this killer clown a letter. He was taking a number of psychology courses and thought to himself, killers like this are master manipulators. The police, the FBI, they all interview them from the perspective of law enforcement. And that is how the killer is going to frame their answers. He thought that to truly understand them, you'd have to ask them questions from the point of view of their victims. And that's when you'll see their true selves. That's when they'll reveal themselves. Pretty smart. He's definitely got a point. And Jason also harbored hopes of one day working in law enforcement, possibly even the FBI and thought that if he could gain the trust of a serial killer, it would look excellent on his resume. He decided to exploit Gacy's attraction to teenage boys and worked on creating a persona that would fit his victim profile, a sexually confused teenager suffering from emotional abuse at home, which makes total sense. But then he decided that to communicate with Gacy, he had to understand the gay underworld which I don't really see why that's necessary, but he went to a local gay bar and asked where he could find a male prostitute. That's that's some fucking research there. The bartender steered him to the personal ads in a particular newspaper where he found an ad reading, quote, for all night companionship, call Rico, experienced pleasure. Ooh la la. He called the number and set up a date at a local bowling alley, thinking to himself, this is just how John Wayne Gacy would find someone to rape and murder. When Jason met Rico, he explained that he was actually a student from UNLV who wanted to write a paper on the lifestyle of a male prostitute. And Rico, as can be expected, was a bit irritated and put off by this pesky college kid. You know, like, what the fuck? But he agreed to talk to him for half an hour if Jason gave him 20 bucks. Rico explained that most men simply wanted him to give them oral sex. And that was the standard date. Some wanted to perform anal sex on him, and that cost the most. But there were also men who wanted to give oral sex, and some who even wanted to be sodomized, though they were the rarest. Jason says he was very surprised by all this, found it utterly bizarre and couldn't believe what he was hearing. To which I wonder, well, what the fuck did you think a male prostitute did? Give you a makeover? This isn't Queer Eye for the straight guy. And (laughs) his his reaction, it just, it makes me believe that he's just incredibly naive. Yeah, he just, I mean, that is definitely coming across very strong. (laughs) Jason then asked him if anyone had ever tried to hurt him, and Rico told him a harrowing tale of how a customer had pulled a knife on him and then urinated in his mouth. Evidently seeing something in Jason's eyes, Rico then asked him if all this talk was turning him on. Jason claims he told him no, 
no, no, no, no, he was straight, and this was just a school project. By the way, this wasn't a school project, so he was lying about that, we do know. Jason says some fucked up shit in his book. Uh, this one really struck me. When I was totally honest with myself, I realized that part of the reason I was reaching out to these killers was that I admired them for their nerve and follow through. Not only did they dare to spit in the face of the rules that govern all people, but they did it repeatedly as if taunting those who would try to control them. Yeah, as someone who studies serial killers, I can emphatically state that this is not why I am fascinated by them. I mean, I think they're monsters, that they're broken, that there's something missing from them. And far from admiring them, I find them terrifying and disgusting. They're not Johnny Rotten. I don't think they have nerve. I think they have a clinical lack of impulse control. Nearly all of them have received serious head trauma, and they, they just simply can't control themselves. And they also can't feel love or empathy. People are just objects to them. They've got their wires so screwed up they equate sexual pleasure with pain and death. They're sad, hollow creatures, literal monsters. Chapter 2, John Wayne Gacy, The Killer Clown On November 24th, 1993, Jason Moss sent a letter the death row inmate and convicted murderer, John Wayne Gacy. That read, Dear Mr. Gacy, my name is Jason Moss and I'm a full-time college student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I'm 18 years old and I'm writing because I thought you might get bored or lonely where you are and thought you might want someone to correspond with. I'm sure there are many others who write you, but I hope you take the time to write me back. You'll see that I'm a pretty nice guy, and I know what it's like to be bored and alone. The constant screaming of my father keeps me secluded in my room when I'm not in school or at the gym. I hate it here at home, and I guess I understand what it's like to need a friend. If you should need anything, like paper or supplies, just let me know. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Your friend, Jason Moss. Just seven days later, he received the reply. In the envelope was a short thank you note, an article written by Gacy describing his version of events and how he was actually an innocent man, as well as a questionnaire Jason was told to fill out if he wanted to continue their correspondence. Questionnaire asked all kinds of questions like, who is your childhood hero? What are your thoughts on sex? And why have you decided to write me? Jason wrote back that he was bisexual, as he knew that's how Gacy described himself. And for the question that asked for something that nobody knew about him, he answered that he was considering becoming a stripper at a gay bar. Jason describes himself as a master at psychological manipulation and uses the metaphor of a fly fisherman delicately trying to snare a fish. But honestly... Telling John Wayne Gacy that you're a teenage bisexual stripper at a gay bar, it's far from subtle. Come on, man. <laughs> it's about as subtle as a hammer to the forehead. Uh, and unsurprisingly, Gacy quickly wrote back, telling him he could confide anything to him, that he was very open and a safe person that took friendship seriously, saying, quote, Hey, one of the things you should know about me is that I'm open-minded, outspoken and very tactful, non-judgmental, liberal, bisexual, and I say what I mean. Nothing offends me and nothing is personal. No subject is off limits. As long as you are willing to be just as open and honest with me, I dislike phony people. Relax about who will see what you write, because I don't share my letters with anyone. And even if you stand on your head and jack off, I would say, go for it, as I'm not into judging. Same with being a male stripper. Hey, life is an adventure, and as long as it's consenting and you feel good about it, then go for it. Jason immediately wrote back, saying, Dear John, 
I will be honest with you. I am a very liberal person. I wrote modestly because I was afraid that you would show my letters to others. Since you said you would not do that, I will be more relaxed with you. When I was discussing sex, I stated that I was interested in trying a lot of different things. Although I haven't tried much myself, I have an open mind to try many things. Right now, there is an older woman who keeps forcing herself on me, and last week she told me to go down on her. I felt uncomfortable. I was afraid to cause any trouble. Well, I will not bore you with that problem. John, I know we just started corresponding. I think you are a great guy. And I am really taking a personal interest in the letters you write me. I want us to become friends. I don't always want to ask you specific questions. I would rather you just volunteer information as the thoughts go through your head, good or bad. It doesn't matter if your letters become 20 pages long. I am interested, and it is important to me. Your friend, Jason Moss. John Wayne Casey immediately wrote back, saying, Your letters sound like you will be much older than 18. You come across very responsible in how you speak. I have a saying. Don't say it unless you intend on doing it. And you came across as if you mean to do what you say. Jason was using his parents' actual address to receive these letters. Using your parents' home address to write to one of the world's most notorious and brutal serial killers is a bold move. But Jason worried that if he used a post office box, it would be a red flag and he couldn't get the honesty from them that a physical address gave. But he also worried about his parents, that they might discover one of these letters and read it. So he was sure to race home from school and be waiting when the mailwoman arrived every day. To be clear, though, his parents were aware of what he was up to, but they didn't actually like approve of it. But he thought if they actually read the disturbing correspondences, saw the things they were saying to each other, they'd definitely make him stop. So he bought a safe where he could securely lock up all the letters. He also said he used it to lock up his Playboy magazines. Again, trying to convince us that he's definitely heterosexual. He's reading Playboy, okay? And he made a big deal about letting you know that. Playboy. It's what straight teens read. It's all wholesome and shit. He also began keeping an index system of everything he said so he could keep all his lies together. It's really just two people trying to groom, manipulate, and gaslight each other for their own base needs, in my opinion. And he says every letter from John Wayne Gacy was like a trophy that validated his existence. So utterly bizarre. <laughs> hey, you need, you need a different trophy, man. <laughs> yeah, like what a weird way of validating your existence. But then again, I do. I mean, I'm a true crime fanatic. I am. I've been tempted to write people. Like I understand the urge to write them. It just he takes it in such a weird direction. Yeah. And Jason asked him directly about the murders, and John replied. Hey, so many people had keys to my house. They were always coming and going. They were using drugs. I was working so many hours. I was never home. It was like house was a recreation center for kids. I had a pool table and everything. Besides, do you really think I'm so stupid that I'd actually bury the bodies underneath my own house? Part of Jason began to believe the clown and think he had a point. Maybe he was innocent after all. So weird, these two trying to manipulate each other to believe their lies. Yes, and you can see all the evidence of a master gaslighter mixed with a psychosexual pervert when Gacy says things like, I believe a true friend will not tell you what you want to hear to stroke you, but let you know what's right from their point of view. So you won't find me stroking you as you have your own hand for that. Once a day, if not more. Say, you mentioned you have a brother? 14? Is he into sports like you? Do you get along with him? Oddly enough, after receiving this creepy as fuck letter where Gacy is trying to include Jason's brother in their weird head games, Jason wrote back asking what he sexually fantasized about. Bold move, asking John Wayne Gacy, 
Pogo the Killer Clown, a documented sexual sadist and convicted sex killer, what his sexual fantasies are. Gacy wrote him back. Hey, what do I fantasize about sexually? I assume you mean when I jack off. Well, it depends on what mood I'm in and what I'm thinking from out of the many past encounters I have had. Since I like being the aggressor, I like to get in on threesomes, both male and females, making them my slaves in bed and doing it all. Straight sex or bisex, I enjoy it all, knowing I can get off with both and enjoying anything. I find if you satisfy your partner first, then you can do anything. So I like to get them off first. And it's not the size of the ship. It's the motion of the ocean. <laughs> As anyone can fuck. Most like cut cocks, circumcised. I'm just seven inches, as I have been asked that many times. Cut with a large head. Gross. And to make it all the more disturbing and creepy, Gacy now begins calling Jason Toy Boy and again brought up his brother, now asking for a photo of Jared. So while Jason says he was incredibly protective of his brother, he goes to him and asks him to write a letter to John Wayne Gacy. Only he won't really be writing him. Jason will tell him what to say, and they'll just have Jared put it into his handwriting to fool the old pedophile and serial killer, trick him into saying all kinds of things he might not say to Jason. What a prank to get your 14-year-old brother in on. Jared says, no way, that guy kills people. <laughs> yeah, he has a definite point. They're fucking playing with fire. But Jason says to his brother, Listen to me, I just want to play with him a little. If he thinks it's you writing, he'll tell you things he wouldn't tell me. It would give me two different sources of information. I can cross-check. Besides, it'll be a fun thing we can do together. Yeah, toy with John Wayne Gacy. A fun game for the whole family. <laughs> Reluctantly, Jason's little brother agreed. This can't get stranger, can it? You may be asking, dear listener. But oh boy, oh boy, you will not believe the limits that this story goes to. We haven't even started yet. And it does not stop. Every week, I'm like, this is the craziest story you have ever heard. But it's fucking true, man. This is the craziest story you've ever heard. Now, Jason starts hinting in his letters that not only does he want to be an exotic dancer, but a sex worker as well. And John Wayne Gacy starts coaching him on how to sell himself on the cold streets. What buyers would want and how they would act. Jason describes it all as a chess game or mathematical problem, thinking, if he says this, I should say that. Then Jason tells Gacy that he received oral sex from a beautiful woman at a party and that the woman then revealed herself to be a man in drag. But he tells Gacy it was, quote, the best orgasm of my life, end quote and informs the killer clown that he'd been masturbating nonstop the last three days thinking about it. Gacy then replied that he was surprised that as an athlete, he'd never had homosexual encounters playing sports before, and that it was quite natural. He described homosexual encounters between straight men as innocent and even wholesome, perfectly normal. Jason then writes back asking if John is attracted to him. Whoa, stepping it up, bam. Gacy writes back, saying Jason was much too inhibited for him as a partner, but admitted that he fantasized about, quote, getting it on with him, end quote, especially since he was interested in having an older teacher. And because of Jason's erotic desires for an older, experienced teacher in the ways of sex, if they were together, they'd probably be doing everything there was to do. And in a brilliant catfishing chess move, Jason wrote an angry letter back saying he was not looking for an older teacher. He wasn't interested in having sex with older men, that he just wanted a friend to talk to. 
Now he's got Gacy up against the rope psychologically, teasing him one minute, angrily denying him the next. All textbook gaslighting moves. Gacy then asks Jason for his phone number so they could talk about it. And Jason, well, Jason gives John Wayne Gacy, Pogo the killer clown, a literal serial killer psychopath that is just admitted to masturbating over the idea of getting it on with him, his home phone number, and tells him Sundays were the best day to call him. Insane. Absolutely insane. Jason had his own private phone line in his room, like every cool 90s kid. And early the next Sunday morning, he was awoken by the ringing. This is a collect call from inmate... Hey, John Wayne Gacy. From the Maynard Correctional Center. To accept this call, say yes after the tone... Yes, operator, I accept. Hey, what's up, buddy? Jason was struck silent, the enormity of what was happening beginning to sink into his brain. Hey, I know this is probably awkward for you. Just relax. I'm watching TV right now, just hanging out in my cell. What about you? Uh, sorry, I was out late last night. I just woke up. Out banging your girlfriend. Yeah, uh, I can't believe I'm actually talking to you. Look, about that letter. Don't worry about it. You're taking it way too seriously. I didn't mean you were trying to use me. It's just that so many people write me because of that. Yeah, well, I'm not one of those people. I didn't say that you were. And I apologize for how it sounded in the letter. None of that was true, and you know it. Oh, you can be a feisty little shit, can't you? What's the matter, Jason? Didn't you get enough sex last night? John, I'm being serious. I really think we're going to have a problem if you think I'm some kind of freak writing you because I need sexual advice. Jason, how about if I send you one of my paintings? I've got this one called Pennywise the Clown. It's from Stephen King's book, It. It looks really nice. One just like it sold in a New York art gallery for $10,000. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I gotta go. My mom's calling me. <laughs> First off, I want a Gacy Pennywise painting so bad. Though my wife would never let me hang it and would probably give me shit forever just because I owned it. But I don't care. I want one. Second... <laughs> <laughs> this is the craziest example of two master manipulators gaslighting each other. It's like my mind is fucking blown. It's almost like mirror images going back and forth, like simulacrums of simulacrums, some postmodern literary theory shit going down. It's crazy, man. Hella meta. <laughs> Daisy sent him the painting as well as a selection of gay pornography and a letter saying, Much of what is known about me is slanted from a media point of view. So as time goes on, I will try to explain fact from fiction. Keep in mind, there are 11 hardbound books on me, 42 others with full chapters on me, two screenplays, one movie, one off-Broadway play, five songs written about me, and over 500 articles. And 80% of them are fantasy and fraud. And despite their weird games of denial, Gacy continued to be overtly sexual, telling Jason he had to try a thing called head over heading. Oh, God, okay. The things you learn from this show, it's, it's very educational. <laughs> Here we go. Head over heading, apparently is when a man lies on the ground and positions their hips and legs on a wall so that their crotch is positioned above them and then masturbates so that they will be hit in the face by their own semen. Yeah, I definitely could have gone not just today, but my whole life without knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> Jason writes him back saying, oh yeah, he tried it and John was right. It was a lot of fun. Just wonderful. Loved it. 
And of course, Jason denies having actually done it because like that would be totally gay or something. And he just told <laughs> and he says he just told John this to string him along again. He strongly denies ever even considering anything slightly weird like that. Just really, really denies it strongly. Insists he'd never, ever done anything like that in his life. Never. Though he is proud of seducing his friend's mom. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just telling you what I read. Then it starts to get incredibly dark. I mean, dark. Prepare yourselves. This is an actual conversation Jason Walsh had with John Wayne Gacy on the phone. Hey, Jason. Yeah, I know your girlfriend. She ain't giving it to you every day, is she, buddy? I can tell. You're right, John. You need to get off, Jason. You know, guys can get you off just as well as girls. We've gone through this before. Yeah, I guess. Your brother, he isn't getting any either. Don't you see what a waste this is? Why hold out when you guys have each other? You and your brother can trust one another completely. It's safe, clean, discreet. Hell, why not get him off a couple times until he keeps coming back for more? You don't know how lucky you are to be in a situation you're in. What do you mean? You guys can use each other to get off all day long. I don't know. It just doesn't sound right. If my parents found out, I'd be thrown out of the house. Relax, Jason. Nobody will ever find out. Then John Wayne Gacy goes into graphic and incredibly explicit detail about how Jason can groom and molest his brother. And a reminder, Jason Moss is using his real name, his brother's real name, and has given this man his actual physical address, where he sleeps at night, and even his home phone number. Insane. John Wayne Gacy then told how he'd had a sexual relationship with his own sister when they were children. And though he says he was the aggressor, it had nonetheless created an enduring bond. What's even more horrific, that part of his story is believed to be true. So fucking disgusting. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> Turn your dial to find the frequency of the past. That's on the drive. With the classic stories of mysteries, sci-fi, thrillers, and suspense are found waiting to be heard once again. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. You'll find a variety of those stories here, in their original form, where each episode takes you to another place or time. The Man of Bronze, Doc Savage. But only when you find the mystery frequency. Available everywhere. The Shadow Knows. Chapter 3, Charlie Manson. Now that Jason Moss had John Wayne Gacy exactly where he wanted him, hook, line, and sinker, he set his target on the next infamous criminal, the one and only Charles Manson. He felt that the best way to get Manson to respond to him would be to show a sense of respect and say he was a colleague interested in furthering his mission. He also wanted to appear poor, angry, racist, and rather than ask for something, offer to give him something. Trying to appear in the know, he made up a fictional character named John Souls to use as a ploy. A guy who he says was friends with Manson and that he knew, figuring Charles Manson was so stupid and had met so many people that he'd never realized it was a ruse and that this person did not exist. Here is the letter Jason Moss sent to Charles Manson. Dear Charles, 
I decided to write you this letter because I was told that we have very similar philosophies on life and society by a mutual friend, John Soldiers, who lives in New York. He told me that you were a very powerful man and that together we could solve a common goal, fixing all the fucking problems with society. You know, I am now starting to understand why the white man is starting to fall. There is a big, powerful hole in society which needs to be filled. The scum are out there. You are the one with the plan. You have the vision that could save us all. I would really appreciate you teaching me the way to save the children and the women. You have done so much for the cause, and I can continue where you left off. Let me know if you need anything, because I am here for you. I don't have much money or a car, but I got my bitch, and we will do what you need. I am not fucking around. Your faithful friend, Jason Moss. Just a few days later, Charles Manson wrote him back, saying, I'll give you something if you give me something, Jack. And I never heard of this person from New York. I learned not to write letters because people play and use you for things beyond your wildest dreams. They say all they gonna do for you, but lie. You'll see when you get old. Send me some magazine subscriptions, Jack. Jason wanted to look tough, so he told Manson he couldn't afford to send him magazine subscriptions at the moment, but promised that if he ever got any money, he would. Which, come on, man. You're using him. He knows it. He's just asking for some subscriptions. I mean, I don't. I think Charlie saw right through this kid. Was like, "You're full of shit, dude. Send me some magazines, and I'll put up with you." But despite not getting his magazines, Charlie wrote him back, telling him to read Khalil Gibran's "The Prophet." Such an interesting book, and I'm a longtime fan of it. Now, here's something interesting that I personally know, being a Charlie Manson fanatic. In 1969. On the night of the second Manson family murders, after dropping Tex, Patricia, and Leslie off at the La Bianca house, Sadie, Linda, and Charlie went to Venice Beach, where they planned to commit another murder on an actor who had played Khalil Gibran in a movie. Exclusive content here. You won't find this connection anywhere else. Uh, Linda ended up chickening out, and the murder got called off. But I think this is a really interesting factoid here. Manson also put Jason in contact with a family member on the outside who started mailing Jason all kinds of stuff, pamphlets, videotapes, books, tapes. And I'd love to take a look at all that stuff. I'll tell you what. Jason says it felt like a political get out the vote for Manson propaganda mailing list. I would have joined that mailing list. But I wouldn't have pretended that I wanted to be a fucking member like he did, though. I just would tell them I would like to look at their weirdness. Like like a lot of people did. A lot, a lot of people wrote Manson. He's an iconic American character from history. Like uh, Henry Rollins immediately comes to mind. He has hilarious stories about being Charlie Manson's pen pal. But Jason gave all the Manson family propaganda he received to the FBI. Which, I don't know. On the surface, it appears to maybe be a cool thing to do. But it also seems like he's trying to kiss the FBI's ass. Uh, Can't they get their own Manson propaganda? Do they really need an 18-year-old kid to do it for them? And he's also being a little rat snitch as well, which you really do not want to do to the Manson family. Snitches get stitches or worse. Much worse. And Manson would write him on the back of other letters that had been sent to him. One from a psychology major at CSU, Long Beach, asking for commentary on the judicial system. At first, Jason thought Manson had no paper and had to write on scraps. But soon learned he had plenty, even with his own letterhead. To me, this is Manson showing that he sees right through Jason. He's displaying his contempt. Like, look at all these bullshit letters I get. And you know what? You're just another one of them. Jason felt Manson was testing him, sizing him up. So he wrote back saying he wasn't in awe of him or his notoriety. He just heard he was a powerful man and they had a friend in common. 
Mason apparently fell for the humble flattery and began sending him the back poems on his personal stationery, a watermark with his infamous eyes scrawling weird poetry over it, like Bebop boot a choo. Ding dong, the bell has rang. To which Jason asked him how to spread the message. Manson replied, They teach you one world, but when you go to live what you forget, you learn that people has been bullshitting you, man. You can't find yourself in anyone else. You are your own experiences, and they can't teach you your own life. Which, that makes sense to me. I don't know, am I crazy? I mean... It's not, it's, he's not wrong. <laughs> it, would, it would sound, I would probably come out across a lot different coming out of someone else's mouth. Um, exploring some of the black magic beliefs the family is said to have held, Jason asked Manson if he encountered demons or monsters. Manson sent him a card saying, Here is a card of a monster so bad, it will eat the hearts of all who put themselves between me and my lone soul self world. You think there is law, and maybe for the rich there is. But Jason's interest in Manson soon faded, because as he did more and more research on him, he realized he wasn't a, quote, real serial killer, end quote. He was just a cult leader whose followers had killed people. Yeah, no shit. Manson is not a serial killer. He's nothing like John Wayne Gacy. But Manson is, to me, still endlessly fascinating. Even more so. Much more so. He's also scary and terrifying. I would definitely not have fucked with him like that. Especially as he had his actual home address. And Jason never did send him any magazines. Though Manson repeatedly bugged him about it, seeing right through his act and saying... Got no books from you, and it's clear by your words that you were raised and taught how to bullshit your own thoughts and pay rent to your old life. You're a gamer, and start out hiding behind your own words. All you think of is all yourself. I know a whole system of people like you who hide in books and school and live on paper, computing, banks, and the past. And I already got books anyway. Don't matter how long you've been working in the mailroom unless you make the rules in the mailroom, Jack. Uh, chapter four. Moving on to Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, Jason fixed his sights on his next criminal pen pal, Jeffrey Dahmer, who I'm sure needs no introduction to the dear listeners of Murder Coaster. Wondering just how much some of this murder memorabilia he was getting was worth, he went to an autograph store on the Vegas Strip and asked them about serial killer autographs. They said John Wayne Gacy letters and signatures weren't worth much. He'd write just about anybody. But that the most elusive signature of all was that of the Milwaukee cannibal, Jeffrey Dahmer, who was notoriously difficult to communicate with, saying he knew of only one man in the entire country whose letters had been answered by Jeffrey. Jason loved a challenge, so he ordered a copy of Dahmer's 230-page confession from the Milwaukee Police Department and began to pore over the pages. And that's some good research there. Uh, I would I would like to get that myself. Uh, an interesting note. Jason said that it was ironic how frail and ordinary Dahmer appeared. And I know Dahmer he gives that vibe, doesn't he? He probably tried to project a docile image. But the truth is, Dahmer was a six-foot-tall weightlifter who'd served in the military. Don't let the demeanor, the glasses, and the dorky haircut fool you. Yeah. Very good point. Like, clearly this is not somebody to be underestimated. Studying interviews with Dahmer, Jason narrowed down his most vulnerable traits. A powerful sexual appetite and a pathological fear of being alone. And then he set out to exploit them. Yeah, it's. I'd say that's a, that's a that's about right. Um, and here is the letter that he wrote to Jeffrey Dahmer. Dear Jeff, 
My name is Jason Moss, and I'm writing you this letter because it's very late at night where I am, and I'm taking care of my sick grandmother. She's been throwing up all night, and I'm afraid she's going to die. If she dies, I'll be all alone. God, I gotta just interject and say, for somebody that's, like, really intelligent, once again, with, like, the the, the subtlety, like, the writing skills and the lack of subtlety, it, like, they kill me. Anyway, back, back into character, sorry. Uh, both of my parents were killed in a car crash last year, and I now have to live with my grandmother. I feel very alone and scared, and sometimes I just want to die. I feel like I live in a world all alone, far from everyone. I've heard about the things they say you've done, and I understand how you feel not wanting to be alone. Yeah. All I feel like I need is a strong man in my life, and sometimes I just think about holding one of my friends, giving him a hug, and never letting go. Maybe we can be friends. Is there anything you need? Is there anything I can do for you, like sending some magazines? Knowing there's someone who cares might make living a little easier. Have a happy new year. Your friend, Jason Moss. He sends magazines to Dahmer, but not to Manson. I'm sorry, but what a dick. That's just, it's just plain rude. Uh, I mean, yeah, he just kills me with his like ta quote unquote tactics. <laughs> uh, but would all of Jason's studying, all he'd learned in his psych class about manipulation and gaslighting work on the Milwaukee cannibal, the most elusive of serial killers, Jeffrey Dahmer? Yes, he got a letter back, a very gracious letter, thanking him for writing, wishing him a happy new year and saying yes. He would love some magazine subscriptions. The most hardcore gay pornography you can find, please. Yeah, prisoners aren't allowed to order their own magazines or newspapers, and that's why all these guys are always bugging him for magazine subscriptions. He also asked Jason to send him a picture of himself. Jason sent him a picture, and Dahmer wrote back, saying... It looks like you have a great swimmer's build. You certainly have a handsome face. I like to see full body shots of you lying on the bed, hands behind your head, with your chest fully inflated. To me, there's nothing more erotic than a handsome young man with a rock hard body and a slim tapering waist. If you accommodate me, I will accommodate you. I think I'm I think I'm slipping into Albert Fish here. <laughs> <laughs> Included in the letter was the photograph of a large erect penis. Oh, Dahmer is so sweet. Alas, this affair was not meant to be, because shortly after their correspondence began, on November 28th, 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer was beaten to death in prison. Now Jason needs to test his psychological skills on another serial killer. Chapter 5. The Night Stalker Hopefully everyone enjoyed and got much out of our Richard Ramirez episodes. We should all definitely know who he was, uh, but knowing that Ramirez professed to have an interest in Satanism and the occult, and loved drawing inverted pentacles everywhere, this time Jason Moss decided to portray himself as the high priest of a Las Vegas Satanic cult. The cojones on this 18-year-old kid, I tell you. He bought LeVay's The Satanic Bible, which I don't think he read honestly. And he rented the classic video, Faces of Death, which he believes showed a real-life satanic sacrifice. And he says seeing this sacrifice horrified him so badly, he passed out cold. Jason Moss then claimed that the murdering cultists seen in this movie were arrested because of the film footage. All of which is utter fucking bullshit. I don't know how fact checkers didn't fix this. That cult scene, like nearly every other scene in the movie Faces of Death, is a reenactment of a supposed, supposed true event. It's not real. No one got sacrificed 
You could not rent snuff films from the video store in the 80s and 90s. Duh. It's all fake. But in his defense, check this out. That cult sacrifice was copied and bootlegged onto so many videotapes that at one point the FBI found a very grainy, unlabeled, random copy of that scene. And they believed it was real as well and started an investigation. So he wasn't the only one who was fooled by this movie. But as we said, it's not real. And guess what? If he had actually read the Satanic Bible, he'd know that LeVay and Satanists do not have human sacrifices. They're not murderers. They don't even believe in a literal devil. And well, here is the letter that he sent to Richard Ramirez. It's a fucking doozy, I tell you. Probably the wildest one yet. Dear Richard, how are ya? My name is Jason, and I'm a huge fan of yours. I worship the Dark Lord, too. And I shed and drink the blood of a sheep every night in the Dark One's name. I'm the Grand Priest of a cult here in Vegas, and all of my 57 members worship you almost as much as we do the Dark Lord. You should be free to shed the innocent blood of the Lamb with us. My people and I would really appreciate if you could give us some words or teachings to help us follow in the path you've set forth for us. I have many women here for you. I will send you some photos of some if you'd like. They love you, Richard. My girlfriend wants you to beat the fuck out of her. She wants you to show her what it is like to worship the Dark Lord. Hail Satan. Hail Richard. Your loyal follower, Jason Moss. Oh so like this is like insane. Like, this is like <laughs> oh. oh fuck. Richard wrote back saying he'd like some photos of the women who worshipped him. I'm, I'm sure he would. And to, of course, send him some magazines. Uh you can almost hear him yawning at this silly letter. Like, yeah, whatever, bro. Just send me some girly pics and some magazines. So Jason asked a friend who had access to the portfolios of models for some pictures and started sending Richard pictures of these random models saying they worshipped him. Yeah, You know, we're getting to some seriously weird ethics here. Jason's already involved his brother, his parents, and now he's getting complete strangers involved in these schemes. And he actually seems to think it was funny saying about his friend, quote, well, I couldn't exactly tell him that the Night Stalker was fresh out of snapshots to masturbate over. So I told him I had a pen pal in Europe who was a virgin and wanted sexy pictures. End quote. And when his friend asks him straight up if he planned on masturbating to the pictures, Jason told him, Yeah, right. Like, I can't get the real thing anytime I want. It was some kind of uh, testosterone flex or something there. I, I don't know what the hell's going on. So he sent Richard the photographs as well as some, quote, hardcore Asian porn. And Richard sent him back a thank you note that had an outline of his hand with the words, hands of doom and gloom, evil hands are happy hands around it. That's some heavy serial killer memorabilia right there. Yeah, you know, Like I said, to me, Richard knew the score. He'd say things like, Death is more than a word or action that takes place. There's no word for it. It's a feeling. One of immense, intense, and delicious nature. Everyone cries, but death is good. Which I think is just him stringing Jason along and giving him what he wants. Playing him like Jason thinks he's playing Richard. Jason asked him what it was like taking the life of an innocent person with his bare hands, goading the Night Stalker. And Richard Ramirez, he does not need much prompting. He immediately wrote back. The power is indescribable, but it's there. As for now, I can only fantasize. That's why this lifestyle suck. But out there, you can feel the draining of their energy, the total ecstasy. Get your mind into it. Savor it. Jason asks him, what do you do right before you take the life of a victim? What goes on in your mind? First, you have to be calm. 
Then you savor the moment. You smell the aroma of the moment, the electricity, the blood, the beast. Ramirez starts sending him incredibly brutal drawings of sexual mutilation, torture, and murder. I mean, really, really nasty, bloody, gory stuff that actually starts freaking Jason out. Ramirez asked for Jason's phone number so they could talk about death, evil, and the devil. And Jason tells him he has no phone. First smart move I've seen from this kid. Yeah. Jason begins to have horrible dreams where he and Richard were strolling down the street together and he watched as Ramirez murdered a young girl, saying, Don't tell me you're all talk. You said you've done this before. Kill her! It got to the point where Jason could not correspond with the Night Stalker anymore. Richard Ramirez had invaded his thoughts, his dreams, and the irony of it was, he was the one who'd been the most willing to talk, to tell him the truth, to show his true horrific self and not hide behind a mask of civility like Gacy and Dahmer. And when he did, he shook Jason's soul to the core and Jason just could not handle it. It's starting to take a toll on his life. His grades went slightly down, ruining his perfect all-A average. His girlfriend broke up with him. He was fighting with his parents. His brother didn't want much to do with him after he confided in him that he was telling John Wayne Gacy they were having sex. Jason says he identified with his pen pals, shared their pain, and understood their motivations. But if you could understand the motivations of Richard Ramirez and John Wayne Gacy, ooh, man. Check out this quote. The only person in my life who was really acting like a mentor was John Wayne Gacy. Chapter 6, Hogo the Clown. And through it all, Jason is still deep in communication with John Wayne Gacy, whose execution day was quickly drawing closer, now only a few months away, though he still seemed confident it would be appealed. And Jason, who is now telling Gacy that he is in an incestual sexual relationship with his own brother, is also writing letters to Gacy as his brother, telling him the same sordid and disgusting stories but from the perspective of the 14-year-old younger brother. And John Wayne Gacy is writing them both back specific instructions on what acts to perform, going on for pages and pages with explicit detailed sexual acts the two brothers should perform on each other. Some of these acts he was instructing the brothers to perform, mimicked the acts Gacy performed during his murders like tying someone's hands above their head and sitting on their chest while forcing them to fillet you with a ligature around their neck that could be tightened and released. You know, we have covered the most disturbing shit on this show. For some reason, this whole twisted scenario is making me, like, physically ill. Utterly revolted. Oh, I hope I'm not getting soft. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty foul. And Gacy had sent Jason three paintings by now. As weird as it is, those paintings are worth a lot of money. But as bizarre as it all got, through it all, John Wayne Gacy proclaimed his innocence in the murders, never admitting once that he was guilty. It became a goal of Jason's to get Gacy to confess to him, to hear him say from his own lips that he was, in fact, guilty. And Gacy was now constantly pressuring Jason to come visit him hinting that he'd tell him things in person that he couldn't write or say on the phone. I got to the point where Gacy said to him, Hey, look, I'll have my attorney send you a check to cover the tickets and hotel and even some spending money. How would that be, buddy? There was really no way for Jason to worm out now, and the truth was he really did want to visit the murderer, especially if he could get him to confess to the killings. Jason's mother obviously flipped her shit when he told her he was going to visit one of the world's most notorious serial killers and said, absolutely not. 
But Jason started conjoling her. Like everyone else in the story, he's a master manipulator. And she finally cracked, but gave an ultimatum. She'd say okay to the visit, but only if she could personally talk to the warden of the prison. So a meeting between Jason's mother and the prison warden was arranged. He told her safety was very important, explaining Gacy wouldn't be able to touch Jason, that they'd be in two different rooms with a glass wall between them, and Gacy would be shackled the entire time. Assuring her that... There hasn't been an incident here in many, many years. Your son will be fine. Gacy gets visitors here all the time. He's old, and surprisingly, he can actually be fun sometimes. Yeah, nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. Oh, good God. But guess what? That wasn't the warden she was speaking to at all. It was a prison guard that owed Gacy a favor. Many of the guards liked Gacy, considered him a friend. He'd been on death row 15 years and become an industry with his art. He made lots of money and could bribe anyone. He had a cush personal cell with his own television, access to all the art supplies he could use, and was given very relaxed visiting privileges. He met often with the warden, and in some ways he was like a celebrated guest. He was also scheduled to be executed in less than a month. Jason called the FBI and told them what he was up to. The FBI seemed cautiously amused and bewildered by him. And an agent Welcher in Chicago agreed to debrief him after the meeting to see if the visit could, in fact, supply any psychological profiling benefits. Agent Welcher told Jason that Gacy kept a large binder full of information on him at all times. And if Jason could get a look at it, she'd like to know what was in it. And if you've ever seen interviews with Gacy, you'll see him with that binder. It's a behemoth thing. She liked to flip through as he droned on and on about how innocent he was. Jason then flew to St. Louis, Missouri, where Gacy told him his lawyer would pick him up. Only instead of his lawyer, it was a dumpy, chain-smoking relative of Gacy's named Ken, who worked as his personal assistant. Ken drove Jason out to the town of Chester, Illinois, to a hotel where he tried to book them into a single room. Jason insisting they get two rooms, wondering if Gacy had presented him as a gift to this weird guy, Ken. Ugh. Chapter 7. The Visit In the morning, it was off to the Menard Correctional Center. Built in 1878, the Menard Correctional Center was the largest maximum security facility in the state of Illinois. A massive, gothic place fortified with turrets and layers of battalion walls. Ken drove Jason through a series of fences and parking lots over to death row, encased in barbed wire and surrounded by fortified guard towers, and dropped him off. Fucking hey, man, this 18-year-old kid, can you imagine going to death row at 18 to see John Wayne Gacy? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine wanting to, like, even with all of my research that I like to do for horror novels and my curiosity. I mean, it's fucking, it's crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I would, I would think that I would maybe, because I'm just so obsessed with this shit, but I don't know, man. I don't, it's fucking nuts, man. Especially John Wayne Gacy, man. Fuck. Jason went through a series of checkpoints and metal detectors, displaying his ID and filling out paperwork telling a bored-looking guard that he was there on a school project. The guard telling him, in the unlikely event hostages are taken, we will not negotiate for your release. If there is a riot or an escape attempt, we won't give an inmate as much as a pack of cigarettes for your release. If we did, prisoners would do it all the time. So you're saying if someone takes me hostage, you'd let them kill me before you did anything to save me? Yep, yeah, exactly. He was then escorted through winding corridors filled with the echoing clangs of slamming cell doors, the yelling and chattering of prisoners, the halls permeated with a musty smell of mildew and sweat. The barred door of a back hallway was open, and there stood John Wayne Gacy, his hands loosely cuffed, smiling, and as Jason shuffled inside, the door slammed shut behind him. <laughs> 
and the guard went walking off, leaving him all alone in the visiting center of death row with the killer clown. Jason describes Casey as looking like the weird, overweight uncle you pretend to tolerate and said his skin was so soft and pale to appear transparent. His hair was combed back with baby oil, the smell of which mixed with his cologne into a revolting miasma that churned Jason's stomach. Hey, nice to see you, the killer clown said shaking his hand and staring at Jason's crotch. Gacy then led Jason deeper into the bowels of the visiting area, into a small private room with two chairs, besides which was Gacy's massive red binder labeled Top Secret Case Files. Gacy asked how the guards had treated him, then began to talk about them as if they were all his old friends, each of the guards having an endearing nickname. They sat making mundane small talk, discussing the weather, football, baseball. Then Gacy asked him if he and Ken had become best buddies last night at the hotel. Jason laughed uneasily at the sexual innuendo, and Gacy then told him that he was weak and helpless. Jason says all light went out of Gacy's eyes. They turned completely black, and he said to him, You're here with me now, Jason. I brought you here. You'll do whatever I say. You know that, right? Are we clear about that? Sure, John. You do know how weak you are, Jason. Jason answered yes, going along with him. Though the truth was he was a weightlifter and competitive kickboxer and was not really scared of an old fat man in handcuffs. Or so he says. Jason then asks, Uh, John, can I see what's in your secret folder? Yeah, I could tell you to fuck off. Please don't do that, John. Jason then noticed Gacy had an erection and was stroking it through his orange jumpsuit. Yeah, I could tell the cops what you and your brother do. They'd take him away, Jason. You'd go to jail. You want to go to jail? Why would you say that? We're friends, right? I didn't say I would do that. I said I could do that. Just remember who I am. Uh, when are the guards coming back? They promised to take our picture. The guards are on the other side of the bars. Jason, do you know how long it would take them to get in here if you screamed? Probably two minutes. I could kill you right now if I wanted. I could take this pen and stick it right in your neck. You'd bleed to death all over the floor by the time you got any help. I have a special treat for you. Lube. John Wayne Gacy reached into his sock and retrieved a small packet of baby oil. And then, then he smiled and laughed as if he was just kidding about the threats of murder and rape. Ha ha. Had you there. The light returning to his black eyes and offered to show Jason the contents of his top-secret book. In the massive binder were notes on every person he'd ever met in his life, including Jason, with meticulous tabs on every aspect of Jason's life. And as Jason stared at the pages transfixed, John Wayne Gacy leaned over, placed his hands on his shoulders, and tried to kiss him. Jason shot up. What's wrong, Jason? You need to relax. Sorry, it's just that you scared me. <laughs> You're so pretty, you hustling bitch. You like to get fucked, you little shit. And to Jason's horror, he saw that the killer clown now had his erect penis fully out of his pants. Sell your ass. You do have a pretty tight little ass. You can't pull that hustling shit on me. I'd never try to hustle you. We're friends, right? Do you know how many little shits died for this cock? Do you want to die for this cock? I should have you bend over and then I can tear the shit out of your tight little ass. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Open your mouth so I can piss down your throat. 
John, you said we were friends. Why are you doing this to me? Then, Gacy smiled, put away his penis, and called the guards in to take their picture. As Jason was leaving, Gacy slipped him a pair of panties and a bracelet and said, Hey, would you wear these for me tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow. This was scheduled to be a three-day visit, and this had only been the first day. Fucking hell, man. The next day, Jason went back to death row. But this time, he insisted that Ken come along, too, and said he was not to be left alone with Gacy again. The next day, Gacy greeted them with a smile, playfully asking if they'd fucked during the night. When Gacy saw Jason was wearing the silver bracelet, he flirtatiously asked if he was wearing the panties as well. And Jason told him that he was, though he says he really wasn't. I don't know if he was or wasn't. He says he wasn't, but... Oh my God, this is so bizarre. J John agreed to let Jason look at his top secret book, and Jason flipped through the pages of his victims' profiles. Gacy saying, They all deserve to die. If you lead the kinds of lies they did, something was bound to happen. They went out into the streets, and they hustled their asses. And then Jason noticed Ken was gone, and they were alone again. As Gacy, beginning to stroke himself, turned to Jason and stated, Jason, last night, I lay in my bed, thinking long and hard about how I'm going to rape you. After I'm done with you, you're going to be on the bloody floor so I can piss all over your face. Seeing your blood on the floor is going to make me very happy. It gets all crazy. There's a lot of strange drama back and forth, each of them playing with each other, testing each other. Gacy shows him his technique for garroting by demonstrating on the bracelet he'd given him, twisting it tight and forcing Jason down to his knees. At one point, he says to him, Why are you playing games with me? I have a fine cock. You've seen it. You've seen its mushroom head. you got to agree it's beautiful. Jason, well, Jason agrees with him. At some point, Ken comes bustling back down the hall, loudly shouting, I'm back! As if to warn them, give the two lovebirds a heads up bringing along with him a gaggle of guards and none other than Andrew Cocorales, one of the infamous Chicago Rippers, a gruesome gang of devil-worshipping serial killers, the leader of whom, Robin Gecht, had actually worked for Gacy at one time. Just very crazy connections there. It's, it's just too much to get into in this episode. Maybe one day... We'll get into all this, you know. Gacy also had very disturbing connections to the Candyman, Dean Quarrel, as well. Some very sinister, dark shit. While Ken and Gacy set to work going over legal documents, Jason has a pleasant conversation with Kokoralis, a short, dim-witted man who'd been convicted of murdering eight women, all of whom who'd been raped, tortured, and had their breasts removed with piano wire. Something that, by the way, has never been done by a bear. <laughs> la 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 ha, nice to meet you. <laughs> Bucarellis tells Jason that Gacy had told him he was a college student and then asks if it was true that all college girls are eager for sex and all you have to do is ask them for it. Jason assures this serial killer that yes, yes, that is absolutely true of college student women. Cocorellis then asked Jason if he could send him some pictures of girls from his college. And Jason tells him he will do that. Sure thing. They wouldn't mind me sending you their pictures to masturbate over while you fantasize about cutting their breasts off with piano wire. Jesus Christ. Uh. And then it was time to leave and Gacy was bestowing more gifts, giving Jason another painting, a signed photo, and a signed copy of his manuscript, A Question of Doubt, saying, Okay, guys, have a good one. See you tomorrow. But Jason was not going back tomorrow. 
In fact, he felt very lucky to have been able to leave death row intact and had definitely seen enough. Gacy was irate when he heard Jason would not be returning, fuming over all the money he'd spent flying him out. But Jason told him his father had demanded he return immediately, and there was just nothing he could do about it, that he was sorry, but he had no choice but to take the next flight home. Gacy then told Jason he should move to Illinois so that they could visit more regularly. Jason said he'd, he'd think about it. But Jason was done playing with serial killers. He'd finally seen enough. Chapter 8. Home Again, Home Again. When Jason arrived home, he had a stack of letters waiting. Both Richard Ramirez and Charlie Manson had written, as well as a new pen pal, Henry Lee Lucas, whom Jason says very matter-of-factly had killed over 300 people, which is absolute bullshit. Again, I don't know how this shit gets past the fact checkers. Lucas's moniker was literally the confession killer because for a cigarette and a cup of coffee, he would confess to any crime you presented him with. In reality, he probably only killed three people, one of which, disturbingly, was his own mother. But Jason had lost his enthusiasm for this project and decided to call quits on the whole thing. He sat his family down at the kitchen table and confessed everything. The deep levels of deceit and lies. How he told Gacy he was having sex with his own brother. (laughs) Fuck, I can't imagine they were thrilled with that. Yeah. (laughs) That's like the most disturbing shit, man. Fuck. So bizarre. How he'd led the Night Stalker to believe he was the high priest of a satanic cult. Which I personally think Ramirez probably laughed out loud about and just used them for magazine subscriptions. And how Charlie Manson, who, as frightening as he was, was actually the most innocent of all these scumbags and had never received the magazine subscriptions Jason had teased him with. Fucking hell. Send Charlie his magazines. A promise is a promise. Oh, it just pisses me off. You know how much one of those poems Charlie sent him was worth today? And he couldn't get him a subscription to People magazine so Charlie could see the fall fashion trends. It's despicable. (laughs) Uh, But Gacy wouldn't let the relationship go. Hounding Jason with letters and phone calls, threatening to expose him and his brother's incestuous relationship, plotting and threatening, having Ken call Jason as well. It all comes to a head when Gacy somehow accidentally lets his devious plan of blackmail be recorded on Jason's answering machine. At which point, Jason said, Checkmate. Your threats are on tape. Which, I don't know, it really doesn't make much sense, and honestly, parts of this story just seem fantastical to me. I wonder how much this guy was exaggerating, and even if he was making shit up. But again, Jason was able to outsmart John Wayne Gacy and get the upper hand. And on May 10th, 1984, after 14 years of appeals, John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, was led to the execution chamber and strapped to a gurney for lethal injection. His last words being, Kiss my ass. Chapter nine, afterwards. When it was all over, Jason says he took up volunteer work to get his mind off the serial killers, serving as a nursing assistant for burn victims with AIDS virus, working for the Make-A-Wish Foundation as well as Big Brother, where he mentored a fatherless 11-year-old boy. He became president of the University of Nevada's Psychology Honors Society and chief justice of the Student of the Student Council, graduating summa cum laude, top of his class, and going on to law school in Michigan. After graduating from law school, he returned to Las Vegas, did an internship with the Secret Service, and even met the president and the first lady. He'd hoped to be a prosecutor, a forensic psychologist, even an FBI agent, but instead found himself working as a public defender. 
he turned his experiences with Gacy into a book with the forlorn title, The Last Victim, which became a New York Times bestseller and a film, and which was the source for most of this podcast. And then, with no warning signs, no red flags, on June 6, 2006, Jason Moss put a gun to his head and squeezed the trigger, ending his own life. Why did he do this? Was the date of 666 significant? Was it because he was haunted by his experiences with these vicious killers and sexual sadists? Well, dear listeners, we're afraid you'll have to come to your own conclusions, for the dead don't talk and we simply don't know. Fucking crazy. Just wow, man. I have to admit, though, I have some issues with Jason Moss's story and book. Obviously, there's like the glaring bullshit, like saying faces of death shows an actual human sacrifice and that the cult was apprehended because of the movie. No, you you couldn't rent snuff films from the local video store. That's ridiculous satanic panic bullshit. It was debunked in the 80s and had no business being in a book published in 1999 and implying that the satanic Bible condones murder. That's just fucking rude. And there's the claim that Henry Lee Lucas murdered over 300 people. Total bullshit. He also says that Richard Ramirez carved satanic symbols into all of his victims, which is also just total bullshit. He he drew a pentacle on one of his victims with lipstick, and he would draw pentacles on the walls, but he didn't carve satanic messages into all of his victims. It's, it's not, not true. Um, also, the timeline in his story is messed up. As some of you may have noticed in the podcast, he says he stopped corresponding with Jeffrey Dahmer because Dahmer was murdered in prison and that he stopped his correspondence with all the serial killers after Gacy's death. But Gacy died a good 10 months before Dahmer. In fact, by a really weird coincidence, you guys may know this, Jeffrey Dahmer was actually baptized as a born-again Christian on the day of Gacy's execution. So, I don't know, all of that is just all mixed up. All that stuff about visiting Gacy on death row, how they were left completely alone in a back room with no supervision. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's true. Maybe, maybe it is true. It just seems so crazy. It's like, when you read it, it's almost comical. Gacy saying, hey, you gotta agree, my mushroom head cock is so beautiful. (laughs) Yeah, it's really wild. It's, it is just, I think my biggest take, not even, not a takeaway isn't the right word, but like, The biggest question I'm left with after going through this whole case is why? Like, why did he have this fixation in the first place? Why did corresponding with these killers give him what it was that he was looking for? Like, what was that thing? Why did he take it so far? Why did he do like a quick 180 at the end and like throw himself into all of this, you know, community service and and charitable work and then why did he kill himself like there's no there's like not really for somebody that was so interested in serial killers and like what made them tick it was like you i can't figure out what made him tick like what was driving him what he wanted to get out of it like what it's like when we first started talking about it i thought like maybe it was his way of you know he didn't have the the nerve or the constitution or whatever it is that it takes to actually kill people and that's what he wanted but it didn't really seem like that were the case he didn't really have any of the other signs of like sociopathic behavior i mean it's just crazy it's like all i all i like i keep thinking in my head is like why why i don't get it i don't get it and to say he admired them that's like like why you fucking admire these people because i'm obsessed with them I don't fucking admire them. Yeah, and then it's, to put it's his just... family and, in particular, his brother, in such harm's way. He gave these people, and in particular, Charlie Manson and Richard Ramirez. Them two, in particular, they have people. Right, that on had the outside. so many people on that. Yeah, right, exactly. There's people obsessed with them that'll do what they fucking say. You gonna give them your home address and tell them about your your? You know what I mean? What the fuck yeah, are you it's thinking, crazy. dude? Crazy. You're fucking with Charlie crazy. Manson. Like, here's my home address, and I'm not gonna send you any magazines and. Are you fucking nuts, dude? What the fuck is wrong with you, man? I know, it's just bizarre. And he was, like, 
successful in so many ways and like well adjusted, like doing all this stuff in college and like becoming an attorney. And it's like, and he was make up married. You know, I don't know how long. I think he hadn't been married very long before he committed yeah. suicide too. It's, his poor wife. That must have been awful. Yeah, it's just nuts. Well, that those are our opinions. We, you know, yeah. Give us your opinions. Let us hear what you think. You know, it's just. Do you want to do the? Do you want to hear me? You know, you want to hear from us that or yeah, we're good. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we want to hear from you guys. Um, you got something you think we should cover? Did we get something wrong? Um, you just want to say hi. You want to send us some music? Whatever, man. Just send us a line at murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. That's murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week. We got a really, another crazy story. Every week we're going to say, this is the craziest story you have ever heard. And we will see you next week. Later. Later.